Brother, go ahead. Uh, Brother Ruckman, uh, in 1 Timothy 1.12, uh, Paul said that he thanked Christ Jesus, who hath enabled me, and that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. My question has to do with uh, how a young man really, really knows that God's put him in the ministry, and uh, along that same line, uh, in light of what's uh, been going on recently, what uh, scripture is there to indicate that a man should quit the ministry? All right. Uh, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he come me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now, we call out a, a call to preach, but a call to preach is not this thing here. This thing when he says putting me into the ministry means putting you into the Lord's work, what we call full time. Now, Paul in his trip sometime was a tent maker and sometime would work to provide for his need and those who were with him. But from the time he was saved to the time he died, his whole life was devoted to traveling and setting up local churches. He was a missionary evangelist, what he was, and he set up indigenous churches. You get a bunch of people saved and then ordain elders and leave the, there and go on down the road and set up another one. So putting into the ministry is a full-time thing, and when we say that, we usually say call to preach, but technically that isn't right. Uh, now come to the book of Acts, and then at Acts chapter 8, and notice technically every Christian is called to preach. Every Christian, including women. Acts chapter 8, verse, uh, verse uh, 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering in every house and hailing, we say hauling, hailing men and women committed into prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Men and women. And every woman is called to preach in the sense you're a witness for Jesus Christ. Now, our trouble is when we think about a call to preach, we think about an official place in the ministry. That isn't quite right. If you get witnessed in the job where you work, you know what they start doing? They start calling you preacher every time. And technically that's right, because when you're telling somebody how to save, you're preaching the gospel. Right. So every, every Christian is called to preach. But it, the question here has to do with being put into the ministry, which is something else. Now, it couldn't be put in the ministry. No woman, woman is put into the ministry. All the elders are men. All the apostles are men. All the bishops are men, all the pastors are men, all the deacons are men. Right. Remember, there's no ordained place for a woman in the ministry, but the woman is a witness. Well, now the question comes up about the call of ministry. There are a number of calls. Moses gets called when he's herding sheep. Matthew gets called when he's the receipt of customs, a tax gatherer. Peter gets called when he's mending fishing nets. And uh, Gideon gets called when he's threshing out uh, wheat. And the general, the general teaching is, or the general thing you see from the scripture is, number one, first of all, God doesn't call any man to preach until, uh, if that man isn't doing something. Right. Every man the Lord laid his hand on to put the ministry, the fellow's doing something when he calls him. Amen, There's nobody sitting around doing nothing. So the fact that you're doing something or busy and can't answer the call doesn't mean anything because every man who was called was busy doing something when God called him. Or well, the next thing about it is, in, in objections to the ministry, the fellow will say, I can't speak. That's Moses. Who will I send? Sent me. That's Moses. Get it. I'm the least of my father's house. Peter, depart from me. Lord, I'm a sinful man. Every guy that gets called got some alibi for not going. Every one of them. And uh, who will you send with me and all this stuff. And yet they wind up in the ministry. All right. Now, the, the call of the ministry, and well, we're out of scripture now for a minute. Those are an example. But the call of the ministry is determined by about four things. The first thing you check yourself on is this. Uh, do you have a hard time keeping your mouth shut? That's the first one. If you have a hard time keeping your mouth shut and then constantly want to open your mouth and witness and put out the word of God, that's one of the signs of the call to preach. Now that in itself does not constitute a call, but it's one of the signs. If you have a couple with it, this one, that you enjoy preaching when you do it, and two, you don't enjoy anything else, you're unhappy and miserable any other kind of work than preaching, that's the third thing. And the fourth thing is, does God open doors for you occasionally so you have a chance to preach? Now those four things there constitute a call. 
If you're miserable doing anything else, the old joke is, well, he's preaching because he couldn't do anything else. That's the old thing. It's true. If God called you to preach, you can't do anything else. <laughs> and you may try a number of things, and that one of them will go sour on you, go to, go to seed on you. So that call is, first of all, miserable doing other things. Secondly, enjoy the preaching. Thirdly, unable to keep your mouth shut. And fourthly, if God has called you, then providentially, they'll, things will open up. Now, they won't, not just to say God will open up a pastor or a church, something like that, but there'll be a chance to preach on the street. Some may call you in to go down the old folks home with them. Some may get a hold of you and say, they want to come to get in jail and deal with the prisoners. Those things will start opening. Those things start opening. That's the Lord leading that way. All right, and regarding to in regarding the quitting the ministry, uh, the only fellow who ever quit it voluntarily in the Bible is Demas. Demas have forsaken me, having loved this present world. And Paul certainly wasn't behind him quitting. And or when Paul's writing the farewell to the uh, last church that he writes to, he says, say to Archippus, uh, Colossians 4, 17, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. Actually, technically speaking, there's no such thing as a fellow quitting the ministry. Actually, if the Lord wants you out, he'll put you out. And if the Lord wants you in, he'll put you in. And actually, if the Lord puts you in, nobody can put you out. Amen. And if the Lord takes you out, nobody can put you in. And there are a lot of people, little Protestant popes, and they feel qualified to tell who's qualified to preach and who's not qualified to preach. And what they say doesn't make any difference at all. And I've had that stuff for years and years. You, you don't qualify, you don't qualify, you don't qualify. I've come to the conclusion, maybe I don't. But I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> I mean, I, my people said the other day, my board of directors said, don't have another man in here. If you have another man here, have him as an associate. Don't give him the church. I said, I'm going to give him the church. Let him pass the church. Oh, no, don't do that. Look what happened last time. You know, they say, we want to we want to have you still here. And these things say you don't qualify. Well, open comes a cassette ministry. It goes worldwide. They play them on the battleships. They got them on the Antietam. They got them on the Lexington. They got them in... Japan, they got in the Philippines. You don't qualify. I trained 200 young men. One of them's a chaplain of the Navy and this chaplain of eight cruisers. He's a King James man, run eight cruisers in the Navy. Amen. They say, well, you don't qualify. The jail ministry opens. I can't handle it and have to send it over to, to East Up and Dayton. Well, you don't qualify. Well, the Nigerian pastors are right, man. I got more correspondence than I can handle. I got me 15 pastors in the Philippines, want me over there for a revival meeting, and I'm carrying on correspondence with them. Well, you don't qualify, but 32 radio stations up. Well, you don't qualify, and then 32 television. I've had enough, man. I've had enough. I mean, if that isn't qualifying, then save me from qualifying. <laughs> because there's no time left to fish. <laughs> there's no time left. Man, there's no time left to do nothing. And this last one is, then it's these paintings for Book of Revelation, and I don't even know where the thing ends. I don't even know where the thing ends, man. It gets in a thing with the, the I've got four secretaries. And they can't keep up with the work. Four of them can't handle the work. Four of them going all the time. And I, I come to the conclusion that if the Lord wants you out, he'll put you out. If the Lord wants you in, he'll put you in. And uh, that's the Lord's business, and he knows what he's doing. Nobody else does. So you talk about quitting. If I were you in the ministry, I wouldn't consider quitting. I wouldn't even think about it. The Lord wants you out, he can put you out. Amen. I think you qualify, Brother Ruggum. Uh, I, I had a couple ethical questions I wondered if you may be, could give me your perspective on that I've come into contact with lately. One is, uh, there are times in, in a Christian's life where they meet people who are uh, doing something wrong, uh, say che cheating on their taxes or something like that, and you're aware of it, either a you know, friend or relative or even an employer, and uh, are, are maybe like in, in the Seattle area, you're not allowed to have a, uh, a mother-in-law apartment, but obviously people do that and that kind of thing. What is your perspective uh, as a Christian's responsibility for informing the government concerning something like that? Do you have... Informing any? the government. Right. <laughs> oh boy. I, I guess that probably answers it. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What do you mean? Informing the government about, about what? About a violation of the law. About a violation of the law. Right. <laughs> well, okay. I'm going to get a couple of 
minutes here. Um, I, I have a second follow-up to that. So I don't know. If, I'll wait well, till you answer that one first. Well, we'll take a little time on that one right there. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm trying to think of a verse that says, "Mind your own business." <laughs> I can't. Right off the right. Right off the. Uh, the, the I can't uh, pull it out of the hat, except in Proverbs it says. A man that uh, that uh, meddles in somebody else's business like a man that takes the dog by the ears. And the idea is when a man has the dog by the ears, he has both hands full. <laughs> and if you let go of one ear, he's going to get snapped. And uh, the other one that says that charity covers a multitude of sins. They were sometimes it's a good idea to overlook some of the faults of the brethren, exercise love in those cases. And let that cover the matter up, and then let God work it out, instead of you working it out. Now, if it's an actual law, for example, in California there's a law that says that if you know of a case of child molestation and don't turn the thing in, then you're accessory after the fact and a part of the crime. Now, that's a case there a little bit different, and that'll come into Romans 13. And Romans 13, where the, where the law is there, then you got something else. Romans 13, 7. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Honor. Verse 3. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou not then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have the praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do eat that which is evil, break the law, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, or avenger, or execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must need, need to be subject, subject to law, not only for wrath, not only because you might get it in the neck, but for conscience sake, so you have a good conscience. So those things there are, those things are there, it have to be an individual case, and you'd have to know the specifics of the case to know what to do about it or not. Come to Romans chapter 12, and Romans chapter 12, Verse 9, this is the general rule on dealing with the Christian, dealing with people around him and dealing with each other. And he says, Romans 12, 9, let love be without dissimulation. That is, no respect to persons. Abhor that which is evil, cleave that which is good, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Which case you're not going to turn a brother or sister in for something uh, if you prefer them before yourself unless you turn yourself in. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And coming on a bit further, uh, verse uh, 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Don't turn them in because they've done you wrong. Provide things honest sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. So if there's any way to avoid reporting the thing, then avoid it. Because you're to live peaceably with all men as much as you can. You turn them in for some things, you're sure not going to have any peace. You're going to start a feud. And then uh, verse 20, If thine enemy hunger, feed him, or be, if he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt eat coals of fire in his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now you might have a specific case in mind where it had to be done. But I could tell you a general rule from these things here in the book of Proverbs. And the general rule would be, I would, uh, I would avoid at all costs tattling on anybody, anytime, any place, anywhere about anything. Amen. If I could avoid Amen. it, Amen. I would sure get out. I'd get around it. I tell you, what happens. What's happened in this country? This country is getting to be a communist country, Amen. and it's setting up on what we call us, what I call Soviet Catholicism. Mm -hmm. That it's going to be a communist form of government with that tolerates one religion. And when that thing is set up, it makes you all spy on each other. Right, and the signs of that are things like this child abuse stuff and child That's neglect. Right. Yeah. If you know a case of child abuse, phone in. Don't do it. Don't do it. Amen. Phone in. What they do with their kids is none of your business, really. Amen. And if somebody you know abusing the kid, you, you go talk to them about That's it. That's right, brother. You don't turn them into the police. But that makes a whole bunch of people spy on each other. And that's what you have in Russia. You have the place from Russia, nobody trusts anybody, and you can't trust your own people in your own family. And that's what Adolf Hitler did with Germany. Got that thing going where mothers telling on children, and children telling on fathers, and fathers on brothers, 
and you get a police state there where the police are the people all spying on each other. And that's a that's a bad that's a bad business. I wouldn't turn a Christian like that uh, for anything, probably, unless there was a definite law about it. If a definite law about it, okay, then Romans thirteen. Otherwise, I'd uh, I'd take the thing and turn over the Lord. First Corinthians five. There's a fellow there that's uh, shacking up with his own mother. Well, he's not turned into the authorities. He's turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Go ahead. I appreciate your answer. Um, the other question in regards to ethics also is uh, a situation where uh, bec that, that a person is knowledge with, in full knowledge and intent has engaged in, in defrauding the government either through uh, income tax or through uh, unemployment benefits that they know they shouldn't be getting. Uh, and later on they feel they feel bad about it and they stop doing it uh, and, and they can even even go to the extent of getting the government to say uh, don't you know forget about it which a lot of the bureaucrats would do I'm wondering if a person should keep that money or should restore it even if they are allowed to keep it because they're holding money that they got knowing that they were doing something wrong well if the government allows them to keep it how do you figure it's doing wrong because when they originally took it, they were doing it in full intent and with knowledge that they were doing something wrong. It seems like the Proverbs are talking about not holding on to money that was inappropriately gotten. So I, but, but there's a kind of a gray area in there, that's what I'm asking about. Yeah, it's real gray. I don't know if I can understand exactly what the situation is there. But in case of fraud, First Thessalonians chapter 4, you don't have to do anything about fraud because the Lord takes care of that himself. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 6. No man go beyond to fraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have forewarned you and testified. <coughs> so if fraud is involved, the Lord takes care of that. You don't have to worry about that. The Lord takes care of it. Now, I'm not a smart enough in matters of tax to know exactly what the case you're given here is. But if the government allows it, you're perfectly within your rights to go along with it. Even though you originally got it in a well, if you originally got it, how did you get it in? How, how, how did you get it in appropriately? Okay. Uh, well, just, you know, say, say for years you, you took too many deductions. Now, you took too many deductions. Right. How can you do that? Uh, you put down, I've got six kids when you had two or something like that. Oh, you lied about how many kids you had. Right. Okay, right. okay, go ahead. That's, oh, a, you have, that's a sin you have to ask God to forgive you for that. Go ahead. Right, okay. And, and, and then the government, you come along and say, well, I, you know, I... I realize I was defrauding you, I want to pay the money back. Yeah, that's confession, restitution, repent. Right. And they said, uh, I'll forget it, it's no big You say, it. sure do appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Amen. 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 Okay. Right. Now, 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 Bob Jones Sr. on that says this, he says, a man is entitled to anything that he gets along the line of God's purpose for his life. A man is not entitled to anything he gets getting out of the will of God for his life. What that means, what comes your way, doing what God tells you to do the way he wants you to do it, you're entitled to, whatever it is. Amen. fellow gives you 500 bucks, keep it. If fellow buys you a new car, thank you. Hmm. Now, if he thinks there's a string attached, then that's something else, but you have him understand there's no string attached. Now, the case right, right there, if you do something wrong, then you have to confess it. That's between you and the Lord. That's a sin against the Lord. It is a sin against the government if they don't look at it as a crime and, and let you have it, then as far as they're concerned, you haven't sinned against them. Do you sin against God? Thou shalt not bear false witness. But the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, comes us from all sin. And along those lines, personally, uh, I'm real lenient with those kind of things. I must confess, I'm the kind of fellow who hasn't had much conscience about some of that government stuff. Amen. I mean, they have stolen enough of my money and wasted enough of my money to where I figure they owe me a living anyway, coming back. I mean, I, I pay them the tax money, and they take it and support abortion with it. Yeah. Yeah. And spending the things I don't believe in spend it on, and they have liquor stores. Yeah. Yeah. And support their bull-eye liquor store with my money, Christian, say man. I give money to the government, they give Charles Manson three meals a day in an air conditioning. Yeah. So I, I say kill the dirty rat. Yeah. I mean, shoot him out. When he goes out of the courtroom, shoot him. Yes, Somebody get the wrong man. Well, you can't bat a thousand. I mean, make a mistake once in a while. But a man been found guilty in a packed courtroom with four or 15 witnesses and he's guilty of, of uh, murder, shoot him. Yeah. But shoot him before you leave the courtroom. Right. 
you save transportation, you know, and all that stuff, and, and legal fees, and you know, and it's to save the taxpayer money. And so if I was something mess up in the tax thing and they allowed it, I'd take every dime they gave me. I'm kind of fella, you know, if they give back a wrong change in some stores, you know, I'm kind of fella, probably go out the door with the change. I'm afraid you give me the shaft enough time before this, you owe me this. <laughs> oh, that's something, else. that isn't very Christian, I know that. But. have a question in Mark 3.29 when it talks about blaspheming against the Holy Spirit and then in 1 John 5.16 when he talks about there is a sin and a death and I would that you would not pray for it. All right. What is it referring to? All right, first of those is Mark chapter 3 and this is the famous uh, unpardonable sin and the charismatics always worry about this sin for some reason. I don't know what they think they committed or what. They worry about this sin, don't worry about the other one I guess. But this thing here is defined in Mark 3, and it, the definition doesn't match almost anything you hear about it. Mark 3.28, Verily I say unto you, all sins should be forgiven to the sons of men, and blasphemies, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because they said, that's going to be defined. One fellow said, well, the unpardonable sin is rejecting Christ. Well. Rejecting Christ a damning sin, that, that's not the unpardonable sin, because many a man has rejected Christ and later on accepted him. Some say, well, it's telling the Lord to get away from you, leave you alone. That won't work. That's what Job told the Lord. There are all kinds of spiritual applications you can make. But in the context, the definition says this, verse 30, because they said, quote, he, that Jesus, hath, present tense, he hath an unclean spirit, now, according to the Bible, that is the unpardonable sin, saying that Jesus Christ has an unclean spirit. And the reason why you don't have to worry about committing it is it would never occur to any of you to say it, and if you did say it now, it wouldn't mean anything. He's not here now. He's going back to glory. That is a sin evidently that only could be committed when Christ was on this earth. Because they said he has, present tense, an unclean spirit. He's not here even now if you even say that about him. So it's evidently a sin that only can be committed when Christ on earth, which would mean it only have two places it could apply. One would be during his earthly ministry to Israel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the other place would be in the millennium. In the millennium when he's on the earth, right there at present, then it might be something a person could commit then. But it wouldn't be anything you would commit as a child of God because in the millennium you're no longer a probationer, you're no longer a sheep, you're like Christ. You worry about committing the millennium. Amen. Oh, I get to 1 John chapter 5. Now this one here doesn't say it's an unpardonable sin, but it says a sin unto death. Now the two readings in uh, 16 and 17, the first reading is a sin unto death means that it's a sin that you have to pay for all your life until you're dead. That's one reading. The other reading is that it's a sin you commit for which God will kill you. 16, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So it looks like a sin a man can commit to where God will kill him and you don't uh, pray for it. And that thing there uh, as it stands, pray about the sin. All unrighteous is sin and there is a sin not unto death. So there is a sin unto death and a sin not unto death. Now, surely he doesn't mean they're just two sins, because he said all unrighteousness is a sin. So the indefinite article must mean that there is a sin a man can commit that God will kill him for, and it's indefinite, could be more than one of them. And there's a sin a man commit that he won't die for, and there's more than one of them. So when you get checking your Bible, you find a number of sins that the Bible lists as sins unto death. Oh, here's the first one, Romans chapter 8. These are all aimed at Christians. These are sins uh, evidently for which God will kill a Christian. Romans 8, 13. In the context of that thing is a saved man. Romans 8, 13. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall what? Die. Die. See that? All right, the next one is in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians three seventeen. 
First Corinthians three seventeen. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. There's another one. All right, then uh, here's another one. First uh, Corinthians chapter ten. First uh, Corinthians chapter ten, verse ten. Neither murmur ye, as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Don't you murmur like they murmured, or be destroyed of the destroyer. Here's another one. Uh, John 15. John 15. Uh, John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. It's taking your life away. And in the passage, verse 6, if a man, man, man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them to the fire and they're burned. Now notice several things about that passage. Notice first of all, when he says that thing, he is not talking about a believer in the body of Christ getting thrown out of the body of Christ and going to hell. I am the vine, you are the branches. They weren't even in him when he said that. The apostle is standing right there. They're not in Christ. When Paul says that, when, when he says, Abide in me, those apostles, they're not even in him. And the Holy Spirit hasn't come to put it. To put it. So it's a, it's a, he's talking about a spiritual application. He's not talking about a doctrine. Well, if that is normal, notice in verse 6, men gather them and cast them in the fire, not the angels. It isn't like the angels gathering out of the kingdom all things that offend them and cast them in the furnace of fire, and there should be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It is like a fellow going to hell. So that thing is a, is a devotional or spiritual application. Abiding in Christ in that passage is not talking about staying in his body lest you get cut out of his body and go to hell. That isn't the, pa the passage. Abiding in Christ in that passage is the sense of staying in fellowship with the Lord through prayer in verse 3, verse 3, through the word, staying clean, and bearing fruit. And the idea there is if a Christian doesn't bear fruit, the Lord takes him away. Now the problem with those things is you've seen Christians that don't bear fruit and they stay around for years. <laughs> and you've seen Christians that follow the temple of the Holy Ghost that don't die for years. And it's possible a Christian to live after the flesh, I suppose, for a while. And the question comes up, how much living after the flesh do you have to do before God kills you? Or how much do you have to defile the temple of the Holy Ghost before God kills you? And the answer is, I don't know. I've got no idea. The Lord keeps the, keeps the ruler. But those things are there. Let me tell you something. If God killed every Christian that murmured, <laughs> whoo, boy, you'd be walking on corpse all the way from here to Spokane, man, up every foot of the highway. So there's a, there's a, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of the men are fully set in them into evil. There's a leniency there in God's part where God puts up with it for a while. But if God has put up for it a while in your life, then note the scriptures and notice that he may not put up with it forever. There is a sin unto death. All right, something else. Uh huh. All right. In the case of Abraham, the thing is real clear. And in twelve one, he gets direct speech, which is a big help. <laughs> and the Lord comes in and tells him, "Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred." Now there's more to it than that. Come to Acts chapter 7, and you, he didn't tell you in Genesis everything that took place there. In Acts chapter 7, you get the rest of it. And Abraham has some definite advantages there when it comes to leadership. Because the Lord not only talks to him in that passage, but in Acts chapter 7, you learn the Lord not only talked to him, but the Lord appeared to him. Which you don't find in the passage in, uh, in uh, Genesis. Acts chapter 7. Uh, Stephen preaching. Acts chapter 7, verse 2. And he said, Men and brethren, the fathers, hearken. Look at this. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come to the land which I will show thee. 
So you can read about that in Genesis and get to Acts chapter 7, you find that not only God did, did God speak to him, but God appeared to him. Now you've got to admit that's, uh, you've got to admit that's getting the brakes. I mean, uh, don't, don't you know life would be uh, simpler, you know, so much simpler if the Lord would just show up in your bedroom at night and say, now here's what I want you to do. One, two, three, four, five, and six. That'd be tremendous. And he didn't do that anymore. And he makes you live by faith. And right when you first get saved and first start out uh, for the Lord, he usually shows you much more than he does later. It's, uh, that's why charismatics are babies. These charismatics all have this big emotional experience. They get saved and they get all come time and sign the healing in tongues and flip flop. And they try to spend the rest of their life living off emotional manifestations. Love won't let you do it. Uh, I, I, I don't believe God speaks in an audible voice, but I believe definitely the Lord speaks to people. Uh, he's spoken to me a number of times. And I remember what he said, too. And it wasn't like uh, somebody coming to your ear and talking to your ear, but very definitely it was him. But I must confess, uh, there was more of that going on in the one week during which I got saved than there was any time since. Now, after you get saved, the Lord expects you to grow up and live by faith. And if you want to find that thing demonstrated, you find that thing in the book of Exodus. Those old Jews are out there and they get those plagues, they get those ten plagues before their eyes. Every time they turn around, God is doing something. And then the sea parts, and they tear through the sea. And every time, every time they turn around, God has manifested himself. And boy, they get across that Red Sea, and then for three days, nothing happens. They run out of water. They start griping and complaining. And the Lord uh, gives them some, some water, but he doesn't do it miraculously. He comes to a place with the 12 palm trees and 12 wells. So you start, it starts getting natural. They start complaining again, you know, and then he, a couple of times, sends manna and quail. And then that's about it. Water out of the rock, that's three and 40 years. See, slows down. So if God just come and tell you, I want you to do this, it'd be just fine, but he doesn't. Now the question is, how do you know about this kinfolk thing? All right, come to Luke chapter 12, in one hand, Luke chapter 12, in the other hand, Luke chapter 14. And the first thing you have to get about the kinfolk is, no matter what God tells you to do or doesn't tell you to do, he has to come before all the kinfolk. And it's very difficult for some people. Some people are, I've never had a great deal of trouble putting God ahead of anybody in my family. The hardest tumble I've had is with my kids. I've been in situations where I felt the situation so serious that, that I'd have to give up my children to get an answer to prayer. And I have been on the floor in prayer and taken a knife and laid it in the pictures of my little old boys and girls and told the Lord to have any one of them in order to get the prayer answered. And the Lord didn't call my hand, but he could have. He could have. They were given. They were given. But some people, some people have a terrible time with that kind of thing. Southerners have more trouble with it than Northerners do. Most Northern families aren't too close. And some city stuff up north, sometimes you don't, sometimes you don't even know who lives next door to you. Yeah. And you don't keep track of all the kinfolk like they do down south. If you have a close family up north, uh, you, don't, you don't know what a close family is. You've been down south, some small southern town. Don't have a shirt split down there, man. It's something. Everybody is kin to everybody in town, man. And, they, and they've known each other for years, both sides. And because that, southerners down there in church messes always have these shirt splits where the families all line up and all vote the same way and go out and get all their friends and vote the same way. have these big old family messes. And it's, the average Southerner doesn't have the right concept of the Bible. The Bible is more important than your family. Amen. Amen. That's right. Now, some of you didn't say amen then. You, you didn't say it because you don't believe it. That's right, brother. Well, you don't believe it is you're, uh, you're not a very good Christian. If you were a good Christian, you'd know that the only reason you got your family is because of this book. Amen. And whether you believe it or not, it's immaterial to me. I don't care if you believe it or not. 
The people of America who enjoy the benefits of all our highest standard of living or enjoy the standard of living are people who believe this book. Amen. And the reason why we got the standard of living we have is because a bunch of folks believe this book. And if you don't know that, because you haven't been around. The thing for you to do is go to India for 10 years, and then live 10 years in Mexico, and 10 years in Spain, and then come back, get some sense in your head. Well, this book goes, then everything goes with it. You know, I was over in Vienna one time, and uh, I must confess, that's a terrible confession for a Bible teacher to make, but I don't believe I already began to teach the Bible, I mean, really put myself into it. Heart, soul, lock, stock, and barrel, hook, line, and sinker, till about six years ago. That's pretty rough, you know, I've been teaching the school 22 years. <laughs> the last six years, you got warmed up. And the reason why is uh, I don't like to teach. Uh, my day of a teacher is a, is, a, is a fellow who tries to tell you how to run when he's lame. And in coming up, I've had to sit in the school desk for so long, I just despise teachers. How would you like to be 44 years old and realize that half your life had been sent, sitting at a desk? When I was 44, half my life had spent, been spent sitting at a desk. 22 years out of 44. And of all those teachers in high school, junior high school, college, seminary, army athletic command school, uh, seminary, Oh, oh, officer candidate school, all those teachers through 22 years of formal education, I couldn't tell you more than three I had any respect for in those years. And the Lord, when the Lord called me to teach, I didn't want to teach. I got out of it as long as I could, I'll guarantee you, and it cost me something too. And I finally got into it, and when I got into it, I never really, just really got thrown into it, you know, because I didn't see the, you know, anybody can teach. Anybody can teach. Of course, I know better now. Not everybody can teach. I've been with guys who played uh, semi-pro hockey and tried, tried to get them to show me how to, you know, stop at 20 miles an hour. I can go on skates. The problem is stopping. <laughs> and he said, well, you do it kind of like this. And, and, I, and I try to get some help. The guy, the guy can't teach me. He says, well, you like this. I said, where do you put your weight? Well, kind of like this. Well, do you shift the... I try to get the guy to tell me what he's doing. He can't tell me what he's doing. He can skate, but he can't teach skating. Yeah. And but I, well, I was over in Vienna, and I've been walking around there all day watching these people sit in the parks, well-dressed people, middle-aged people, just sitting there, much neater dressed than Americans, and sitting there just staring out into space, hours of time. Austria has the third highest rate of suicide in the world. Like it's. Japan and Denmark, Japan and Sweden, something like ahead of them, and then Austria. But I had to go look at that place in Munich, Frankfurt, Stuttgart. I look over there and I thought to myself, isn't that something? These Germans, you can't tell them nothing. What are, what are you going to tell a German? You're talking about music? A nation that produces Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven and Hanno and Schubert. You got, and Wagner, you're talking about music? What are you talking about? We're talking about his history, they got the greatest story. You're talking about science, Einstein. You're talking about political philosophy, Karl Marx. We're going to talk to him about it. We sent him a drill. I think we sent him a drill over there one time, a 16th inch drill, a fine piece of craftsmanship, and they drilled a hole through it and sent it back to us. <laughs> through the drill, that kind of thing. Why? What are you going to tell that German about anything? About rockets? Von Braun, you had to get him over here to help you get to the moon. And there's all that money and all that science and all that art and all that wisdom and all that intelligence, the highest man living, and they're just going to hell like a bullet and don't know one thing about that book. Yeah. Not one thing. Right. Catholics, lost. Lutheran, lost. We got old farm people down in South Alabama and everything to the sixth grade that know more Bible than any president of any republic in Germany. When I saw that stuff, you know, it began to eat on me. And the Lord said to me, he said, well, what's wrong here, Pete? I try to avoid it. He said, well, what do they need here? What's the need? <laughs> well, the need is they don't know the book. Yeah. If they knew the book, they wouldn't be in the mess they're in. But there's nobody to teach them the book. So, Lord, I called you to teach the book. I said, Okay. I got with it. I'm with it now. I'm with it. 
but it took me some time to get it. All right, now, I said that because I have a low estimation of the book. I don't have a low estimation of the book. My, I, I know what the book is worth. Now, this building here and the clothes you got in your back, the food you ate today, you got because of this book. Amen. And this book goes, your food and your clothing and your money and your friends, your mom and your daddy and your kids go. All right, Luke chapter 12, verse uh, 51. Suppose you I'm come to give peace on earth? Yes, yeah, says everybody. I tell you, nay, no. Oh, somebody got it wrong. <laughs> he said, do you think I come to send peace on earth? Nope, but rather division. For from henceforth there should be five in one house divided, three against two, two against three. The father should be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Another passage says, and a man's foe should be they of his own house. All right, Luke 14, 26. Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father, I bet you'd never heard of Swindle talk about that one, did you? If any man come to me and hate not his father, you got something from Bill Gothard's youth tension conflict on that? <laughs> you probably don't. If any man come to me and hate not his father, imagine Shuler out in California preaching that. Wouldn't that be a flip out? <laughs> if any man come, they don't believe that book. That's right. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children, and brethren, I didn't write the book. You used to glare at me, it won't do you any good. <laughs> I'm used to being glared at, I thrive on it, I, I, I enjoy it. <laughs> I said to somebody recently, they told me, they said, you ought to take this church and give it to soul. And so I said, maybe he wouldn't like it. And they said, why not? I said, he'd get too much opposition. And they said, well, you're going to get opposition too. And I laughed and I said, well, you, you don't know me very well. I'm an old dog, man. I have a hundred people out there sitting in front of me hating me enough to kill me. It won't even keep me awake, man. I wouldn't even take a baby aspirin. You know what bothers me is people treating me nice. That's what gets me. <laughs> Just, I don't, I don't know how to respond, you know. You know, you're sure, you know, it's sure a nice suit you got, Brother Rockman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you sure got blessed in that message. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right. Hate his own. Brethren, sisters, now underline it. Yea, and his own life also. See, don't capitalize the first part just because you don't like people. You have the same attitude toward yourself you have toward them. You see that? And his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, isn't that something about the Bible? It's to honor your father and mother. But a man can't come to Christ and let his hate his father and mother. You know what he's telling you there, right? Well, I'll show you something there. I'll show it to you. Turn to Exodus. It means putting God first. And he puts the, put, put the name first so that when people look at how you respond, they'll think that you hate your own people by the way you're acting. You don't treat your mother and daddy right. You don't treat your wife and children right. Because you put the Lord ahead of them. Exodus 32. Old Moses comes down and he says in verse 26, come down on the mount. Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is my Lord aside? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of the Levi got themselves together. And he said, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side, go in out from gate to gate through the camp, and slay every man his brother and his companion and his neighbor. Go kill your buddies and your family. And they went out there and they killed 3,000 men. You know what the Lord said about that a little bit later? Come on, the end of Deuteronomy, this song of Moses, when, when Moses got through and gave these prophecies, look what the Lord said about Levi in that passage. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter, I'll make it, uh, I said 32, I didn't 32, it's 33. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, verse 8. Deuteronomy 33, verse 8. And of Levi he said, Let thy thumb of thy urim be with thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah, who said to his father and his mother, I have not seen him. Levi said to father and mother. 
neither did he acknowledge his brethren nor his own children. Killed his own kids. If his daddy and mama had a part in that ritual dance back in Exodus 32 when Moses came down, he killed mom and dad and his kids. For they have observed thy word. You see that? And they came down there and Moses said to that bunch of Levi, said, go there, anybody took part in that dance, kill them. And I don't care if it's your mother, father, your brother, your brethren, your companion, your neighbor, kill them. And they did it. And they did it. Now, you know the New Testament. The New Testament says the weapons of warfare are not carnal. The New Testament says talking about hating your mother and the father and your brother and sister, your wife, your children. Obviously, it's not talking about getting a sword and killing them. <laughs> But obviously it means when it comes to what God tells you to do, you're to observe his word and do what he told you to do. And if it crosses mama or daddy or your wife or your children or your brother or your sisters, you just have to cross them. Amen. So when it comes to those things in regard to leadership, you get the first principle right and the first principle is you make it in your mind that what God tells you to do and shows you to do, you are going to do it no matter what the kinfolk say. And then you do it, no matter what the kinfolk say. Okay. You know, there's nothing worse. Well, there's a lot of things worse. But it's pretty bad. Uh, for a Christian, after you've just been saved, you have to go back and spend Easter or Christmas with your family and they're not saved. You ever have to go back at Thanksgiving or, Easter or Christmas and get with the people, you know, mom and daddy or uncles and aunts and the grand folks and they're not saved. You all get together as one big happy family. And you know it doesn't work because since you've been saved, the people that are saved are closer to you than your own people. Yeah. 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 And you go back there and sit down there talking about who they scored on last night or what this movie, did you so-and-so play in this movie? He sure was good in this movie. I should enjoy it. And you're sitting there, yeah, man, what a drag, man. Yeah. And, there's, and there's smoke all through that room, you know, and stuff. And you're just, you're sitting there trying to, <laughs> that's a torture, man. That's a torture. All yeah. right, oh, something else. And the sentence says, Paul writes in expectation of the rapture, in expectation of the rapture while he is alive. Right. And that would be somewhere around 84 to 87. And I guess my, the hard time I was having is how does that square with inspiration if Paul is writing inspired material that indicates he knows the rapture is, or he's expecting the rapture to come. Uh -huh. What else in, is maybe he writing about expecting or thinking about that might not be right? That's the dilemma. That might not be right. Well, if I told you the Lord could have come then, what would you say then? Wouldn't he have been right? Yep, he could. Yeah. Could he have come then? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> okay. Well, let me show you. Okay, let me, let me come place here. I'll show you a place. Let's go back to Samuel. I'll show you a place where it goes even stronger than that, where it's not just a man writing under inspiration about something that doesn't take place. Uh, in this case here, it's a case where God himself says something that doesn't come to pass. You can imagine that. And this thing here will be uh, uh, 1 Samuel. And uh, 1 Samuel, let's find this thing here. 1 Samuel chapter 24, I think it is, 1 Samuel 23. Yeah, 1 Samuel 23. Now I'll show you that thing on the possibility of the Lord coming in the souls in, in Paul's day in a minute, but let me first show you this, about this thing, about thing of being in the spy literature that doesn't come to pass. 1 Samuel, you remember one time the Lord told Jonah to go down to Nineveh and cry against that great city and say in 40 days Nineveh shall be overthrown? Was it overthrown 40 days? No. See? It's that thing. In fact, when the Lord gives those things like that, there's always a variable. And the, and, and the condition is not always given. He says to Noah, go down there 40 days and Nineveh be overthrown. And the people repented and God saw they turned from their works and then he changed his mind. by what he, That's what got Jonah mad. He was holding God to his word. I mean, what are you lying? I mean, you wouldn't think a fellow accused God of lying, but, but Jonah is mad about that, and Jeremiah gets mad about it. Jeremiah one time said, Will thou be to me altogether as a liar and waters that fail? <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Some of those guys get bitter, boy. They get bitter. I always do appreciate 
I always appreciate Job and Jeremiah more than Paul. I always have. Because uh, I, Paul has got too much victory for me. He's, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable around him. It's, uh, it, did you ever read the Pauline epistles clear through and notice that he never complains? Yeah. Try that sometime. Read the Paul, 13 Pauline epistles. There isn't one of them where he ever complains. You'd think he would somewhere, but he never does. He never does. Always got the victory. That's, I don't know if I'd like to hang around a fellow like that or not. I don't know that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, be a follower of me as I'm a, I am learning. Listen, I'll give you a good one. I am learning whatever state I'm in there with to be content. Yeah, in solitary with blood running down your back. I learned no wife, no children, no church, no school, no life insurance, no health insurance, no retirement, no social security, no son, no daughters, no clothes. I am in whatever state I'm in there with to be content. <clears throat> and I, of course, I got an alibi. You always have an alibi, you know. And I, I tell the Lord, well, you know, you took him up there and showed him heaven. Now, if you'd showed me that, I could take a lot. <laughs> I could take a lot more down here than what I take. Uh, you take old Job. He didn't get any of that. All right, First Samuel 23, and I'm beginning verse nine. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Question. Will Saul come down as thy servant heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. And he did. Then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men in the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. They didn't. You say, why didn't they? Verse 13, David got out of there. <laughs> but now you see, that kind of verse there, that's what drives a Calvinist up the wall. That'll put a Calvinist out of business, man. Because the Lord predestinated what would take place and it didn't take place. See that thing? That shows you the Lord's foreknowledge goes ahead of predestination. Yeah. The Lord knew what would happen if David stayed and what would happen if David didn't stay and had made arrangements for both of them. Amen. But how did it come out? It came out on his free will. That's right. Boy, you tell that to a Congress, that'll make him climb the wall. Sure will. Well, that was the thing right there where, where God said something and it didn't come to pass. All right, now in Paul's case, here's what you, what you got. The nut that tells us the distance between the, the, uh, the uh, rapture and the, and the tribulation. Now we assume this. We assume that uh, when the Lord called the church out, that as soon as the church is called out, Daniel's 70th week takes place. In which case, if Saul was waiting, Paul was waiting for the rapture in his day, if he'd been caught out, we were to alive, remain in the coming of the Lord. Then the tribulation would have taken place right after they were caught out, back in here. Now this thing is going on right now for nine or eight, nine years. But the other night when I was drawing for you, I showed you a system one fella had. And that system that one fella had was a system like this, where the church is going to be caught out. And then there's going to be a period of 33 years preceding Daniel's 70th week. And then Daniel's 70th week, and then the Lord comes back to set up the millennium. That's the system that fella had. And his date here for the advent is 2029, sitting up there. But he got 40 years preceding that thing. If you subtract the 40 years from that date, you get the same date I gave you. You get 1989 when you come through. Now, the nothing tells you when the church is caught out, Daniel 70th week starts. And the problem comes up, if one day of the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, and we went through that, then obviously a period of 6,000 years has to pass before the Lord comes back. So if Daniel's week, 70th week takes place as soon as the rapture takes place, Daniel's 70th week has to take place over here, and therefore you have to have 2,000 years go by before the Lord comes back. So why was Paul waiting for the Lord to come back when he knew that 2,000 years had to go by before Daniel's 70th week took place? That's the problem there. But one day I noticed this. You got 4,000 years for Christ. And when Christ shows up, 
They say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Where's Elijah? He's John the Baptist. The whole thing is set up for the second advent right there. And after Christ comes up from the dead, there isn't one thing that has to be done before the second advent. So the Jews got to be in the homeland. They were in the homeland. You see, Antichrist had to show up. He was there, Judas, just hung himself. Well, that dude's come up from the dead. When Christ comes up from the dead, all the conditions are set for the second advent. And we know the Jews rejected Christ, so it was postponed and put forward. But the question comes up, say in the book of Acts, what if the Jews had accepted Christ? Or if they'd accepted Christ the nation, then the rapture would have taken place and Daniel's 70th week would have started right there. And the question comes up, how could Daniel's 70th week started there if that seventh period of a thousand years that would show up over here is a millennium of rest? There's one of them, two of them, three of them, four of them, five of them. You're short two of them. But then, back there in Genesis 1, 1, it said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and didn't tell you what happened. And the earth without void, formed without void, dumps upon the face of the deep. And then when God remade it, he remade it over here. That date is 4,000 B.C. That date is 6,000 B.C. And then it makes one, two, three, four, five, six rest over here. The Lord had everything worked out, so if the Lord, if they'd accepted the Lord, the second coming of Christ would have, could have taken place during the book of Acts, and the thousand year period worked out a perfect set of seven, and they rejected him, so he just flipped it over and did it the other way. All right, that's all we have time for now.